not in my world, I know. Okay, my clock says it's 12 o'clock. Uh, Gail, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, I'll go ahead and get this going. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the I-29 Moo University uh, Dairy Webinar Series. Today's topic is feeding higher forage rations for more profit. Uh, appreciate Gail, Dr. Gail Carpenter joining us uh, to discuss how to increase forage content of rations and increase margins for dairy producers. She'll cover increasing solids, maintaining animal health, and achieving peak production levels in this era of increasing feed costs. Uh, Dr. Carpenter joined Iowa State in January uh, 2021 as assistant teaching professor in dairy production. Her background includes uh, a lot of research, teaching, and outreach in applied dairy cattle uh, management. Uh, she was a dairy nutritionist for CSA, Animal Nutrition, uh, prior to coming to Iowa State. Dr. Carpenter currently teaches undergraduate courses on lactation and applied dairy farm evaluation. Dr. Carpenter, thank you very much for presenting today. All right, thanks for that introduction, Fred. Uh, and I know we're a relatively small group today, so if you have thoughts or comments or questions along the way, just feel free to kind of uh, unmute yourself and shout them out or drop them in the chat. I don't know. I won't always catch them in the chat, um, but I'm sure Fred will uh, cut me off if there's a question that pops up there. So uh, we can feel free to kind of keep it loose and informal today if everybody's okay with that. One uh, thing wanna... before yep. you start, just to make sure that the right screen is showing. Jim, are you seeing Dr. Carpenter's? Yep, I'm seeing her slides. Yep. Very good. Sorry. Gail. Yeah, perfect. All right. Well, let's jump in and start with a little bit of a discussion about what exactly is a high forage diet. High forage diet is one of those words that just means something different depending on who you're talking to. Um, so some people will say technically every, anything over 50% forage is a high forage diet. Um, some people will say 60%, 70%. There's farms even feeding an 80% forage diet. And so what we mean by high forage really will vary depending on who you're talking to and what part of the country you're in. The other thing we have to uh, think about when we're talking about dairy diets in particular, or ruminant diets, is that there's such a diversity of feedstuffs that not every feed will fit really neatly into either a forage or concentrate uh, definition there. So um, what we mean by even just forage, we can kind of debate uh, back and forth a little bit when we're talking about uh, specific feed ingredients. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail later. Uh, I also want to say before we really dive into it that obviously uh, grazing dairies are going to be uh, high forage um, high forage systems, um, but we aren't really talking about pasture feeding or grazing in this webinar. We're, we're focusing on confinement systems here. So why feed high forage diets? Uh, there was a, a survey published in 2017 of feed industry professionals in the Northeast. Uh, and these individuals reported that 91% of their herds increased their forage feeding levels in the past 10 to 15 years before this survey was done. So it is something that is increasing in popularity. The reason for that is that homegrown feeds are cost effective. Uh, it's more affordable to feed, uh, to feed feeds that you, that you grew on your own farm versus purchasing in feeds. Now the, the break even on that can kind of vary based on grain prices. When grain prices are high, it's definitely a lot more affordable to to uh, use homegrown feeds. Uh, when grain prices are low, um, that can be a little bit more uh, of a debate there. Um, unfortunately, lately, we don't see oftentimes that grain prices are low. Um, so with this, with this era of rising feed costs, um, these homegrown forages do tend to be a lot more cost effective. The other thing is that uh, high, high forage diets do promote the production of milk components, milk fat and milk protein, and that's what our milk checks are based on. And so that combination of decreased feed costs as well as increased components will lead to increased income over feed costs. And I also want to say that part of the reason that we see uh, these high forage diets being more common now is because we've made such advancements in terms of our plant genetics, uh, our, our forage management. Uh, we've come a long way in terms of being able to increase our forage quality. 
And because we've been able to improve our forage quality as an industry, we're able to get away with feeding higher and higher forages in our rations. So this is a, this was a, uh, uh, not necessarily a survey, this was a comments from 16 different farms in New York that were feeding high forage diets. And they were asked, you know, why, what are the benefits that you've seen going on to a high forage diet? So this, this wasn't based on um, data collection or anything like that. This is just producer, uh, producer perception. Um, but these farmers indicated that they saw improved milk component levels, improved longevity in their herds. So cows that were able to stick around for multiple lactations, uh, and uh, more voluntary culling, uh, so able to remove cows for voluntary reasons versus involuntary reasons, as well as improved income over feed costs. Uh, on the flip side, what they saw less of um, after switching to high forage is reduced acidosis or other metabolic disorders, uh, in uh, fewer hoof health, foot health problems, um, probably as a result of that reduced acidosis levels, improving overall hoof health, uh, again, they saw kind of going along with that improved longevity. There were decreased culling rates and again, more voluntary culling. Uh, and, and combined with all of these different uh, uh, health, and, health and wellness and cow comfort, veterinary costs were reduced overall. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of benefits to the high forage feeding. Now I wanna step back here and talk a little bit about you know, forages and the ruminant. Let's talk about ruminant nutrition 101 here for a minute. So for, ruminants are able to, they're, they're magical animals. This is one of the reasons that I really love dairy nutrition, ruminant nutrition, but dairy nutrition in particular, um, is that we have all of this carbon in the world in the form of cellulose. And we have, we have so much land that is unusable um, for crop production, but we have forages that are out there. And ruminants have this, this special ability to be able to take that carbon that's unavailable to monogastrics like humans and convert it into these very high quality protein sources like milk or beef. Uh, and so they're able to convert that unavailable carbon into highly digestible protein for human consumption. Now, the reason I'm gonna talk about carbon here is carbon is the basis of energy metabolism. Energy metabolism is based on carbon metabolism. That's actually where the term carbohydrate comes from. So when we're talking about carbohydrates, we're talking about fiber, but also starches. Uh, and ruminants are able to utilize all types of fiber. So as long as there are sugar polymers or, or carbon compounds such as cellulose, hemicellulose, uh, starches, fructans, uh, sugars, uh, disaccharides, as long as, there are, as long as there are sugar compounds in a feed, ruminants are able to utilize them, as opposed to humans who aren't really able to utilize things like cellulose because we don't have the proper enzymes. Ruminants can do that. So BFA, volatile fatty acids, are produced by this microbial digestion, and the volatile fatty acids are what are actually utilized by the animal. So cell, the, the two main uh, carbohydrates that I want to focus on here talking about BFA production are cellulose and starch. Cellulose is converted into acetate and butyrate, which are lipogenic. Now, lipogenic just means that they promote fat genesis, fat production. Uh, and so acetate is going to be our main volatile fatty acid that is a precursor of milk fat. So improving our acetate production can lead to more milk fat production. Sorry, one sec. Apologies. Uh, and then starch uh, is, convert, is broken down into propionate. Propionate is glucogenic. So propionate is converted to, to glucose in the liver, which is also important. Uh, and it also provides energy for the animal. But when we're talking about milk components and specifically milk fat, that acetate from cellulose is really what drives that. Now, we talked about all the great qualities of forages and why forages are really great for ruminants, but there are some downsides, especially when we're talking about uh, dairy management. So forages do vary a lot based on digestibility. Uh, uh, vary a lot in digestibility, and this can be based on a plethora of different things. So uh, the genetics of the plant itself, the plant maturity, uh, uh, dry matter, you know, uh, drought conditions, weather conditions, that there's a, we see an incredible variation in the, in the quality of the forages that we produce uh, for dairy production. A general rule of thumb that you see too, is that as we are able to promote and increase the actual yield or biomass of a forage crop, 
we decrease the available carbon. So we decrease the digestibility uh, or the quality of that feed. Forages are also really susceptible to molds and toxins. Uh, so, you know, we deal with mycotoxins uh, most years when it comes to corn silage. Uh, you know, if we don't properly store our forages, our, our haylages, our, our silages, or our dry forages as well, uh, they can be prone to mold or toxin production. Uh, and those can have negative impacts on health and production as well. So we need to be careful. Um, those are something that, that we need to be managing. And then also forages are, are just gonna be a little less palatable than the concentrates in the diet. So the concentrates are, I call them the, the candy. Uh, they, the, they'll, they'll go for the dessert first, right? Like they'll pick out the, they'll pick out the tasty parts, the concentrates, and you know, they're, they're vegetables, they're, they're greens, they're leaves, uh, the, the actual forage part of that TMR. are just not quite as palatable, not quite as tasty to the cows. Uh, and so convincing cows to actually eat the whole TMR can be a struggle uh, under different systems. So just a little bit more about plant carbohydrates. I'm not gonna quiz you on this or go through this in a lot of detail, just a, a little bit of a reminder about where the carbohydrates in plants come from. Generally, uh, the carbohydrates in the cell contents of a plant are going to be our more digestible. Uh, so that's where our sugars and our starch and starches, our fructans, those, that's where those are going to be in the cell contents. In the cell wall itself, that's where our structural carbohydrates are gonna be. So that's what gives the plant rigidity, allows the plant to grow tall, and that's gonna be our fiber, um, specifically our ADF and our NDF components. We're gonna talk about NDF a lot over the course of today. Uh, so just a reminder that NDF consists of hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin, um, which are our more digestible carbohydrate, our more digestible non-structural carbohydrates. Lignin, uh, is not technically a carbohydrate, but it's included in ADF and NDF um, because it, that's the, the lab process of measuring those includes lignin in it. Um, so lignin is included when we talk about ADF, NDF, even though it's not a carbohydrate itself. As we increase the lignin content of a feed, we are going to have less digestibility overall. Um, so really what we're focusing on when we're talking about fiber digestibility is that NDF component, that hemicellulose and that cellulose component. So thinking about this a little bit, thinking about you know, the, the highly digestible starches that provide a lot of energy versus the cell wall, um, what is corn silage? Uh, so is, corn silage is one of those uh, ingredients that I mentioned earlier that it, when you sit and you think about it, it doesn't really neatly fall into a forage or a concentrate. So when we think about the, the corn plant, uh, when we harvest corn silage, we're harvesting our entire corn plant. So we have the big stem that goes up the middle, we have all the leaves on the corn plant, but we also have those ears of corn that contain that highly digestible, high quality starch. Uh, so in a way, corn silage is part forage, but part grain. Um, but when you're sitting down on balancing rations, most of your software is going to just look at corn silage as a forage. Uh, so High corn silage diets are also going to be considered high forage diets. So if you're feeding a lot of corn silage, it's probably going to be a high forage diet. And most in this part of the world, at least in the Midwest, most of our high forage diets are going to be using corn silage as the primary forage source. And so that's why when we're kind of when we're talking about high forage diets, it's not always very useful to say, oh, 60% versus 70% versus 80% forage. What's really more useful when we're having discussions about high forage diets is the forage NDF, not just the percent of the ration that is forage. So if you're feeding low forages such as corn silage that are gonna be lower in NDF, you can feed a higher forage diet because you're having more, uh, more digestible nutrients also provided by that forage itself. So just a review here also about fiber digestibility. Um, so this is just a, a general schematic about how fiber is digested in the rumen. So when you send in a feed sample, you'll get a printout coming back with a whole bunch of letters on it, right? Uh, nutritionists love just assigning letters to things. So you're gonna see NDF, but you're also gonna see NDFD, which is NDF digestibility. Uh, and you can see NDF digestibility at various time points. So when we're doing NDF digestibility, that is an in vitro procedure. Um, so the feed sample will be incubated. And then over time, they'll take a measurement of the fiber that's remaining um, to see how much has disappeared. 
So it's going to start out at 100% of the, of the fiber in there. There's going to be a little bit of a lag. Uh, and this is true in in vitro um, procedures, but also in the animal itself, it's going to take the microbes a hot second to be able to start attaching and, and degrading that, that fiber. After that lag period, you're going to have a lot of fiber disappear very quickly. Um, and then you're going to, and that's what we refer to as a fast pool. And then it's going to, and then that curve is going to hit an inflection point and it's going to degrade more slowly. Uh, and so we call that our slow pool. And then eventually you're going to hit a point where no matter how long you, you sit and you incubate that sample, the fiber just never goes any lower than that. Uh, and so this is where we get the term UNDF240. Um, so we let it sit in vitro for 10 days, an excessively long time. So way more time than we'd ever need to be able to um, make sure that we don't, that all of the fiber that's going to disappear has disappeared. Uh, and then we collect the sample and see how much is left over. So UNDF240 uh, is a common metric um, used to describe which fiber is undigestible. So generally speaking, everything under this line right here, um, where no more, no more fiber is degraded, anything under that line is going to be unav unavailable for digestion. Anything over that is theoretically available for digestion. However, we know that the, the feed is not going to sit in the rumen just until it's degraded entirely and then move away, right? So, so because of the, the passage rate in the rumen, because there's always feed coming in and going out, most of those forage particles won't sit in the rumen until it's entirely degraded. So this, uh, the proportion of feed that actually gets digested is not going to be the same as the amount that's available for digestion. So a common metric that we use to describe NDF digestibility would be NDFD30, which is NDF digestibility at 30 hours. Um, and so you can see here, this is, uh, this is where that would be pictured on this example graph here. Um, NDFD48 is also measured sometimes. Um, and it's mostly important that I, NDFD30 is, is the one that's commonly used and, and probably the best metric of how fast fiber is going to digest. Uh, it's important if, you're, if you have two forages that you're looking at side by side, don't look at NDFD30 for one and NDFD48 for another. Um, make sure that you're using a common metric and not comparing apples and oranges between the two. So NDFD30 is what most of us are going to be using at this point. Now, depending on the fiber that you're looking at, some, that might have more fiber that's unavailable for digestion. Uh, and so this... Uh, this particular example graph, um, there's, uh, I don't have numbers here, but there's more unavailable fiber uh, and less available fiber. So this particular sample would have a higher UNDFD 240. And this is really important, especially when we're talking about high forage diets, because for every 1% increase in U UNDFD 240, we can expect a 1.84 pound decrease in dry matter intake. So we're really focusing on, you know, in any ration really, but especially in our high forage rations, we're really focusing on promoting that dry matter intake. And if we're using forages that are lower quality and have more undigestible fiber, we're not gonna be able to push that intake as high as we'd be able to otherwise. So I'm uh, gonna ask you to uh, bear with me on my crude drawings here for a sec. I wanna talk about digestibility a little bit in passage rate. Um, so if you have a rumen, you're going to have this rumen mat sitting on top, uh, fiber mat sitting on top of the rumen, and then you're going to have more of those rumen contents underneath uh, being digested. And all day as the animal's eating, there's going to be contents coming into the rumen and contents leaving the rumen. And the rate at which they are leaving the rumen is called the passage rate. Passage rate can vary on a lot of different things. The more feed that a cow is consuming, the higher the passage rate will be. Um, and the, the determining factor on whether or not a feed particle will leave that rumen is going to be its size. So once the feed particle is reduced to a small enough size, that's the point where it's going to be able to leave the rumen. So we can have a shorter, a smaller, a slower, sorry, passage right there, uh, where, where feed is not able to leave the rumen as quickly. Um, and if the feed is not able to leave the rumen as quickly, it's going to stay in the rumen longer. That can actually increase the digestibility or the digestion that occurs in the rumen. So of that available 
um, of that uh, proportion of the NZF that's available for digestion, more of it will disappear. Um, but this is a little bit of a, this can be a, a little bit of a catch 22, right? So um, as more of it disappears, it's going to fill the, or as it disappears more slowly, it's going to fill up and we're going to start having problems with gut fill. Um, and that will actually decrease the cow's dry matter intake there as well. So we want to avoid any situation where we're filling the gut to the extent that, that we're going to depress dry matter intake. Uh, so particle size, like I said, particle size is going to dictate how fast a particle, will, uh, the feed is going to leave the rumen. Things that will impact particle size include the length of the particle when it's consumed. So a four inch piece of silage is going to uh, break down more slowly than a one inch piece of silage. Uh, and the digestibility of the feed itself, right? So if you have the higher level of NDF, UNDFG 240, higher level of undi undigestible fiber, it's gonna take a while for that to break down. Um, she's going to have to chew that cud multiple times to be able to physically break down uh, that piece of feed. So it's a little bit, there's, there's a lot of complicated relationships that occur in the room in there. That's kind of what makes it fun. Um, but what I wanna focus on is that is that particle size and particle length. So that there's a, that is what um, determines your physically effective fiber. So we don't want overly long particles, but if particles are too short, the fiber is not going to be able to have a physical effect on the rumen. So we want that physical effect. So the physical effective, physically effective fiber, the physical effects that we're talking about there include the scratch factor, the sloughing of the rumen wall, which is good for papillae health and growth. The actual formation of that rumen mat uh, is going to improve rumen health overall. It's going to increase the diversity of the microorganisms that are in the room in there. Um, longer particles that need to be chewed, she's going to chew her cud more frequently. That cud chewing is going to increase saliva production uh, and overall rumination. So there's having, having long physically effective fiber in the diet does have a beneficial effect. So I'm sure you've all seen a Penn State shaker box before. This isn't new information to you. Uh, it's a common way of, of measuring physically effective fiber on farms. Uh, I've included here a table with the Minor Institute's Penn State Shaker Box recommendations, which I really like. Uh, so in that top sieve there, we want to have less than 5% of the feed retained um, because that is our sortable material. After it gets over the length of that, of that, uh, the holes on that top sieve, those are the, those are the particles that cows can pick out, right? So um, what I always tell students is, you know, when I eat a salad, uh, I see salads as a way to, uh, eat cheese, croutons, and ranch dressing, um, not so much the lettuce themselves, and cows are kind of the same way. So cows will pick out the lettuce in their diet if it's, if it's long enough, right, but they'll eat the croutons, the cheese, and the ranch dressing. Um, so, so if you leave too much of those long lettuce particles in there, they're not going to eat their veggies, they're going to focus on the, on the tasty stuff. So we want to make it as hard as possible for them to be able to pick out the stuff that they don't want. So if we have most, uh, more than 50% of our feed particles on that second sieve, that's a nice sweet spot. So they're smaller than the top sieve, um, but they're still long enough. And I got it in millimeters here. I'm sure you've all seen the shaker box before and can kind of picture uh, the size, you know, it's 19 millimeters. It's gonna be a relatively large size on that top hole. So anything smaller than that, um, but not so long that it kind of gets below that four millimeter mark is going to be kind of a sweet spot there. They're still are still long enough uh, to be physically effective. They're going to be more physically effective than the four millimeter sieve. Um, and so if we maximize at around 50 to 60 percent of the diet in that middle uh, middle top sieve there, that's kind of a sweet spot in terms of our physically effective fiber. So what I'm going to talk about, what I've kind of been talking about, what I'm going to continue talking about a, a lot of what we've summed up here today, or what a, a lot of what we're going to talk about here today can be summed up in this concept that you have a happy rumen, you're going to have higher milk components, right? So if we can keep that rumen, um, you know, moderated pH, not having huge fluctuation pH, we can keep that cow ruminating, we keep the microbes in that rumen happy, that's what's going to drive our milk components, right? So, um, so that's what we're focusing on with the high forage diets. So we have tools uh, that are being developed to kind of monitor, do we have a happy rumen? We can't just ask the rumen if it's happy, obviously. We can't even ask the cows if they're happy. Uh, so 
to keep that rumen, uh, to, to be able to determine if we are keeping that rumen functioning at optimum, we have some other tools that are available to us. One of the most recent ones that's growing in popularity is measuring de novo fatty acid production. So de, again, back to ruminant nutrition 101, de novo fatty acids are the ones that uh, the, the cow is actually producing herself in her udder. And that's opposed to the preformed fatty acids, which are the ones that she consumes in her diet. And so data that's been collected over time has shown that we have a much stronger relationship with de novo fatty acids and fat production than with preformed or dietary fatty acids and fat production. So as cows eat more fatty acids in their diet, we do tend to see an increase uh, in fat percent, but you can see this relationship over here isn't very closely related. Now, if we're looking at our de novos, however, we can see a really tight relationship there. So a great way to be able to improve our fat production is to increase our de novo fatty acid production. And that's again gonna be coming from that acetate um, produced by rumen fermentation. So we know that there's a strong correlation of de novo fatty acid production to milk fat. Um, the way that we increase those de novos is with good rumen fermentation, which promotes DFA production. Uh, I've got some targets over here for de novos versus mixed origin. Um, and this is based on uh, that 0.85, that's actually based on 3.75% milk fat which a lot of people are trying, are able to achieve much higher milk fat than that. Um, so this, uh, when we call this a target here, um, that's based on that 3.75% milk fat. So depending on where you are or what your current baseline is, that may or may not be a target for you. Um, so a couple, there's been, I'm gonna show a little bit of this research here in a minute, but one of the ways we know to improve that de novo fatty acid production is to decrease our stocking density, making sure that cows are not severely overstocked, as well as optimizing feed intake. Uh, and the reason I wanna sit here and point this out, and it's a, something I'm gonna harp on a little bit a couple times throughout this presentation, but we think of high forage diets as being what kind of keeps that rumen happy, right? The, the, you know, the, the buffering, um, the physically effective fiber. Um, we think of high forage diets as if we feed high forage diets, we're not going to have acidosis and our cows are going to have happy rumens. But that's not the only thing we need. Uh, it's not just enough to feed a high forage diet to get that optimum rumen, um, rumen environment there. Management plays a huge role in that. Uh, sometimes feed management can be even more important than the actual feed itself that you're feeding. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit more throughout this presentation here as well. Now, the nice thing about milk fatty, uh, de novo fatty acids is there's also a, a relationship to milk protein. Um, so when, you know, when protein prices are high, we get questions about how can we improve milk protein production. Um, and the good news is that a lot of, you know, you can, you can do amino acid balancing. There's some dietary stuff you can do to improve milk protein. But really, some of the strongest ways that we can improve milk protein is by improving milk fat. Um, so that's why I'm kind of including components as a general uh, general all-encompassing term here because that healthy rumen environment is going to improve both milk fat and milk protein production. So I just wanna point out a couple examples here looking at some of the effects of management. Um, and this is looking at SARA or subacute ruminal acidosis. Uh, this was a abstract published a few years ago out of Minor. I don't know if it's been um, actually published as a paper yet, um, but it was published and uh, presented at ADSA. Um, and one of the things they found looking at different cows who were subjected to the SARA is that the stocking density um, was actually at least as, or in some cases, even more important um, than the diet itself uh, when it came to, to rumen health and rumen acidosis. So making sure that we're keeping our stocking density, um, you know, a little overstocked is usually fine, but severely overstocked becomes a big issue. Um, and especially when you're feeding a high forage diet where you really need to optimize that dry matter intake, stocking density becomes even more of a bottleneck. Uh, there's a couple studies here, just gonna summarize a couple studies looking at farms from New York and Vermont with either high or low bulk tank de novo fatty acids. Again, high de novos means happier rumens. Uh, and they did find a, a clear relationship with stocking density. So herds with high uh, de novo fat um, had 1.05 cows per stall on average, whereas the herds with low de novo fat production had 1.2 cows 
cows per stall, so 105% stocking density versus 120% stocking density, really impact that de novo fatty acid production. And then herds with high de novo fatty acids were more likely to deliver feed twice a day versus once a day, uh, keep that stocking density below 110% and provide adequate bunk space, at least 18 inches of bunk space to each cow. Now moving on and talking a little bit more specifically about how we get these high forage diets fed. Um, like I said, to me, uh, when you talk about 50%, 60%, 80%, whatever percent you're talking about forage in the ration, that is not entirely meaningless, but a little bit meaningless. Um, what we're really interested in when we're talking about high forage diets is what is the actual NDF intake from the forage? Uh, so we can assume generally a good rule of thumb would be, um, in, there's some exam, there's some, there's always an exception to everything, right? But a general, you know, rule of thumb would be uh, about 75% of your NDF in your ration coming from forages and about 25% coming from concentrate. So if we look at the total NDF intake, uh, that's going to be limited in most cows about 1.1 to 1.2% of a cow's body weight. And this is based on experimental data that's been taken mostly back in the 90s, actually. Uh, field data uh, on farms that are feeding high forage diets suggests that this can go higher, maybe even up to 1.4% of a cow's body weight. Um, and part of that could just be that we are doing a better job of learning how to feed forages and learning how to feed NDF from forages. So like I mentioned, you know, our forages are improving. We're better at managing forages than we were 20 years ago. Our genetics are improving. There's more digestible forages and more digestible hybrids available. So that, that old rule of thumb may not be, uh, may not hold in every single case. So if 75% uh, of your NDF is from forage, at 1.2% at uh, NDF intake, 1.2% of body weight as NDF intake, that means that 0.9% of a cow's body weight will come from NDF from forage. And so just to show you a little bit of an example of that, uh, if we take a 1500 pound cow, uh, her forage NDF intake, uh, taking that 0.9% value, uh, we would assume that she will consume approximately 13 and a half pounds of NDF per day. If our forage is about 50% NDF, that means that we would feed about uh, 27 pounds of forage to that cow. Uh, a couple things to consider here. Uh, so first of all, first lactation cows, your heifers, they are going to be obviously smaller, uh, much lower body weight than your older cows. Um, so this is a good reason to house your first lactation cows separately because they're going to be limited on their dry matter intake compared to those older cows there. The other thing that I think is really important to point out is that your nutritionist really should be measuring body weight or estimating body weight somehow. Even if it's not on a scale, using a weigh tape, um, you know, driving a, driving a uh, trailer with a few cows in it over a scale, uh, there's, there's different ways to kind of get a bootstrap estimate of, uh, of body weights there, but, but actually having an understanding of, a measured understanding of the body, average body weight of cows in your herd is really important when it comes to ration balancing. And it's something that gets overlooked a lot. So that's just a, that's just a side comment there. Another thing we can look at when we're feeding these high forage diets is the use of additives. Now I understand that there are so many additives out there in the world. Um, there are, and a lot of them are worthless. Uh, a lot of them are too expensive. Maybe they're effective, but they're way too expensive for what they actually do. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and parse out all the differences and additives that you can use. Um, I'm, but I, so I just want to point out a few tried and true um, things that we know are generally going to be effective. So first of all, uh, sugar um, is a great way to improve fiber digestibility. The fiber digesting bacteria just go bananas over sugar. It really helps them. Uh, it gives them the energy that they need, uh, and it helps improve fiber digestibility overall. So if we're looking at six and a half, seven and a half percent of diet dry matter, about one and a half to two pounds of sugar in the diet every day. Um, that's a good spot to really optimize that fiber digestibility. Now this can be done uh, in a few different ways. So you can add sugar to the diet. Um, there is sugar uh, in molasses, for example. Um, there's a few different ways to get sugar in there. Uh, and depending on which part of the country you're from or which region you're from, you're gonna have some different options. Um, but it's a, it's a good way to improve, to kind of jumpstart those fiber digesting bacteria there. Direct fed microbials 
yeast cell wall extracts, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, there's a lot of products out there that are that kind of enhance that overall rumen health. When we're doing that, enhancing that rumen health, that again is supporting those fiber digesting bacteria and helping them um, do their jobs better. Now using binders or preservatives, uh, that's another additive that can be useful, especially when you have high mycotoxins, for example, uh, using a binder to kind of control that. Like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of the downsides of using for of feeding forages is that they are susceptible to molds, to toxins, uh, to those mycotoxins. So controlling that through the use of a binder or preservative is a, is a, can be an effective way to maximize the forage in your diet. Uh, some other general comments about maximizing returns from forages. Um, you can go one extreme or the other on both of these. I kind of tend to prefer to talk about how much milk are you getting per acre versus tons of feed per acre. Um, so are you focused on the quality of the feed or the quantity of the feed? And you can go to extremes in either direction, right? You can, um, you can, set, you can focus in on one to such extent that you lose any benefit of the other. So I think a balance there is really important. The other thing to think about is that when we're talking about investing our research resources into uh, producing high quality forages, if you're deciding where you want to allocate those resources, it's important to focus on the forage that is going to make up the biggest component of your diet, right? So uh, uh, usually in our part of the world, it's going to be corn silage or our, our uh, diets are going to be really predominantly corn silage. Uh, but uh, if you're if you're choosing where you're going to donate your time, your resources, focus on the the important forage, the one that's going to make up the biggest component of your diet. Uh, you know, planning, going back to the beginning and planning from the very beginning, consider what your choices of hybrid are. So there's going to be a lot of different options in terms of more digestible and less digestible uh, forages there. Um, so we have BMR, uh, BMR hybrids for you know several different forages, uh, most notably corn silage. Uh, we have low lignin alfalfa. Uh, these you're going to, again, sacrifice some of that yield, um, but improve your digestibility. Uh, so it's really important. I'm not an agronomist. I'll point that out real quick, uh, but it's important to work with your agronomist and your nutritionist when you're choosing these hybrids to make sure that you're balancing the digestibility and the yields there. Uh, making sure that you're harvesting at the correct maturity. Uh, and also you can consider high cutting corn silage. So if you cut it, if you raise that, that cutter a little bit and you cut it just a little bit higher, uh, you can improve the overall digestibility of that corn silage. But again, you're going to lose some of that yield. You're going to decrease some of that corn silage inventory. And some years that's not a good idea. Some years that's a bad idea. Some years you might be fine. Um, and inventory, you know, I'm going to bring this point up a couple more times before we're done today, uh, inventory is something that really is challenging for high forage feeding. Uh, and so when we're decreasing our inventory, we're, we want to make sure we're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot down the line. Making sure that we're protecting the leaves. So especially we think about this a lot when we talk about alfalfa, um, uh, because we, we deal with leaf shatter when we're dealing with alfalfa and, and the leaves are where most of the, the nutrients are in the alfalfa plant. Um, so making sure that you're harvesting that at the correct dry matter, um, making sure that you're not bailing it when it's way too dry, um, that's important for alfalfa. But we can also talk about protecting leaves when we're dealing with corn silage as well. So you can use a, a fungicide, for example, to make sure that you're, um, that you're maximizing the, the nutrients in that leaf of the corn plant. Minimizing corn, uh, spoilage, uh, and this is kind of a lot of, you know, back to basic stuff. Uh, making sure we're covering, packing, using an oxygen barrier, uh, feeding at a high enough daily rate that we're not letting that, that bunk face sitting out and spoil. Um, all of those best practices are really especially important when we're talking about high forage diets. Uh, using an inoculant here, I, uh, I put lactobacillus buchneri. Uh, Dr. Bill Mahana always tells me that that doesn't matter what inoculant you use as long as it's got buchneri in it. And um, I don't really like arguing with him. He's a lot smarter than me. So um, I, uh, so, so I, that's a, that's a good choice when we're looking at different inoculants to use. Uh, for corn silage in particular, uh, looking at kernel processing, making sure we're monitoring our kernel processing. I have actually, uh, the cup sitting on my desk here, the old style cup, um, 
that you've probably seen before, taking a scoop, um, making sure that you have uh, very few whole half or whole kernels uh, when you take random scoops um, as the corn silage is being put up in the bunk. Um, I don't use this one for kernel processing. It's actually here um, as a drinking cup, <laughs> uh, but, but making sure that we're monitoring those kernel processing and breaking that corn, corn kernel open um, to enhance the digestibility and the availability of that starch. And then making sure that we have adequate storage time. And this is another place where inventory really comes into play here. We want to make sure that we have enough inventory uh, of corn silage from year to year that we're able to extend it past, you know, at least three months of, of storage time before we start feeding the next year's crop of corn silage. So unfortunately, no matter what we do to maximize our uh, corn silage or our forage quality, every farm is going to have to deal at some point with lower quality forages. Unfortunately, not all of the, of, of the uh, forage that we collect is going to be of the highest quality forage. So what are we gonna do with our stuff that's a little bit lower quality? Well, the most obvious one, and actually some animals on our farm don't do as well with the high quality forages. Some of our animals, need lower quality forages. So making sure that we're allocating smartly uh, the high quality forage versus the low quality forage to different groups of animals on the farm. So uh, your, your replacement heifers uh, are going to deal a lot better with that low quality forage um, versus the lactating cows. Uh, your far off dry cows are another great place to kind of put some of those lower quality forages. Uh, to some, depending on uh, the, if there's spoilage or mold or toxins or anything, you, uh, you could feed it to close up dry cows as well. Um, and then your low producing lactating cows are also gonna be a little bit more forgiving uh, to some of those lower, less, less digestible forages. And then on the flip side, looking at where to feed your highest quality forages. So if you have BMR, low lignin alfalfa, uh, some of those really highly digestible hybrids, focusing on the uh, high risk times or the high high input times of a cow's life. Um, so that close up period and that um, especially that fresh period and making sure that we're getting those those highest quality, most digestible forages to those um, high risk cows. Now another tool uh, or, or measurement um, that is I've been really interested in lately uh, is this idea of PEUNDF240. And I hate the term, to be honest with you, because like I said, uh, nutritionists just love like putting letters on things. And, and to me, PEUNDF240, that's too many letters. Um, I, don't, I don't care for the, the term, um, but it's a really interesting concept that's been, um, the folks at Miner have been working on uh, uh, um, making, uh, they've been working on making sure that it's, it's a true concept. Uh, so PE, we have the idea of PENDF, and UNDF240. Uh, so we've talked about both of these, the physically effective fiber and the undigestible fiber. And PEUNDF240 basically combines both of those into a single term. So that UNDF240, um, usually that is limited. Cows will not consume UNDF240 above 0.35 to 0.4% of their body weight. So at a certain point, UNDF240 will start limiting dry matter intake. It's going to cause that gut fill and, and, and cause cows to stop eating as much. And then that physically effective fiber, that particle size also dictates how quickly a feed can move out of the rumen. So they're kind of, they're, they're measuring different things, um, but they're somewhat related concepts. So the idea of PEUNDF240 is that you can have a feed that has high physically effective fiber, but low UNDF240 or vice versa, or feed that is low in both PEF and UNDF240 are high in both. Uh, so it's, it's a neat concept there because they're both kind of related to that idea of digestibility and passage rate. Um, but where I think it becomes a useful concept is that you cannot change a feed's UNDF240. You cannot change whether um, that digestible fraction is going to become more or less digestible. It's static, it's not gonna change. But you do have control over the physically effective fiber. You can, uh, grind feed more finely, or you can chop it with a longer particle size. So to some extent, you can, uh, you can impact that passage rate by, uh, by uh, tweaking that PENDF. And so if you know you have a forage that's overly high in UNDF D240 or UNDF240, 
uh, you might choose to chop it more finely so that you're not, uh, you're not promoting that gut fill. Or uh, if you have a feed that's low in UNDF 240, you're afraid you're going to increase your passage rate too much, you're gonna to have too much escape, you can increase that particle size a little bit. Not too much, not like four or five, six inches, but you know, like an inch or two, um, making sure that you're um, chopping it just a little bit more coarsely um, to kind of hold that passage rate down and hold that feed in the room in just a little bit longer. So it's kind of a neat concept with a, with a long name with too many letters in it. Uh, so talking next about feed management, and I kind of alluded to a few of these things throughout uh, the, the talk here, but just to kind of hit home a few different points, uh, it's really important when we're feeding high forage diets to avoid overstocking. Um, because we are actually probably going to impact the, that cow's feeding behavior because they will take longer to consume a high forage diet than a high concentrate diet. They're just going to spend more of their day standing and eating at the bunk. Um, and so because of that, if you have boss cows that can move their way to the front of the bunk and can spend as much time up there as they want, that means there's gonna be less hours in the day for those submissive cows to be able to get up there. So because of the amount of the changes in the feeding behavior with high forage diets, this um, avoiding a, a little overstocking again isn't the end of the world, but avoiding that excessive overstocking becomes even more important when we're talking about high forage diets. Uh, again, looking at separating those first lactation cows from older cows, if that's possible with your facilities, um, that's a way to uh, make sure that those cows, again, they're not dealing with some of those social pressures of the older cows. Uh, it's possible, especially in summer months, that you may need to feed more frequently, uh, especially if it's hot weather uh, and you're feeding lots of fermented uh, forages, um, it's going to heat up at the bunk and spoil more readily at the bunk. So we want to avoid that if possible. Along the same lines, we want to push up our feed more frequently. Uh, so we want to make sure that cows are at, so as they sit, you know, they're spending more hours in the day, uh, sitting and eating. And as they do that, they, they're going to kind of move feet around and push feet away from the bunk. Uh, so we want to make sure that they have feed within reach at all times throughout the day, excuse me, all times throughout the day. Um, and we also, that also kind of helps prevent sorting to some extent as well, because as you push up the feed, it's going to remix the feed a little bit. And so they're going to spend, they're going to be able to sort less if you're putting feed up more frequently. And then of course, monitoring particle size as well as sorting. So some, so the keys for success for a high forage diet, I, you can read articles. We could spend a lot of time talking about it but it really boils down to two things. You need good quality forage and you need a lot of it. So inventory is a big struggle with high forage diets on some farms. Uh, so again, that 2017 survey out of the Northeast, the main reason for farms not feeding a higher forage diet is that quality, um, that, that lack of highly digestible fiber and a lack of a place to store it. Where are we going to keep our forage inventory? So, when we're talking about inventory, it's not just a question of, well, we fed a 60% forage diet, and now we're feeding a 70% forage diet, so we need 10% more forage. Uh, you also have to consider that they are probably going to eat more when they move on to a higher forage diet. So you need to have 15, maybe even up to 30% more forage for a high forage diet to account for that increase in dry matter intake. We also need, because there's such variation in uh, nutrient analysis across even a field, um, let alone looking at different fields. Uh, we need to make sure that we are regularly analyzing all of our forages um, because there can be such variation in nutrient analysis. And a really key, a really important one here is going to be the dry matter content. Uh, it's easy enough to do. It should be done very regularly. And that is because, again, we're trying to optimize that feed intake. We're trying to promote that feed intake as much as possible. And when a significant portion of your ration consists of corn silage or some other wet forage, fluctuations in the dry matter content of that forage are really gonna impact the as fed amount that the cows consume. So you might think that cows are down in feed, but if it's a change in dry matter, not a change in dry matter intake, that won't be reflected unless you're measuring that dry matter uh, of the content of that feed regularly. So it's pretty important to measure that um, preferably weekly if possible, more frequently for larger farms. 
And then we also have a, uh, the TMR mixer can be a problem. It's just a logistical issue. So this is a picture uh, actually taken at our Iowa State Dairy um, soon after we'd switched to dry hay um, from, um, from baleage. Uh, and we did have a little bit of a learning curve with that uh, just because it was a fluffier diet. Um, and if you're feeding higher forage, you're going to see kind of a similar thing. You're just gonna see a diet that takes up more physical space. Uh, and, uh, and you can see here, we got some hay spilling over the side here. So uh, it's possible you might have to mix more smaller loads. Uh, you might have to get a larger mixer. You might have to get a second mixer, um, but just be cognizant of the fact that you're going to have, um, your, your diet is just physically going to take up more space when you switch to a higher forage diet. Um, and I think I'm possibly running short on time here. So I'm gonna kind of fly through the next couple of things. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about alternative forages. Um, this is work that I did, I did. I did work in this area when I was at the University of Guelph uh, in Ridgetown there, uh, funded uh, in part by the Ontario Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Uh, so these are a couple of my master's students. So this is uh, Becca. She finished her master's degree this past spring. Her research focused, she's a, a nutritionist now in Ontario. Um, and her research focused on feeding uh, switchgrass, switchgrass hay to dairy cattle, uh, switchgrass hay as a replacement for straw um, because it is a biomass crop and it is low nutrient quality, but it's pretty similar to straw overall. Um, so she fed it to lactating cows. We also fed it to dry cows. That works pretty well for dry cows because it has a pretty low potassium content. So it works well for a decad. Uh, and this is Juan. Uh, Juan just de defended a couple weeks ago, actually, right before Christmas. Uh, and he is down in Honduras, um, back at the family farm down in Honduras. Um, but his research focused on cup plant, cup plant. Uh, and, uh, and you can see a picture of that here, um, also a biomass crop. Uh, so a lot of my research that I did when I was in Ontario was uh, take a random plant and see if cows will eat it. Uh, and it turns out cows will eat a lot of things and they will make milk on a lot of different things. So when we're talking about alternative forages, what are the alternatives that we're talking about? Uh, cover crops growing in popularity, cocktails uh, uh, as a cover crop or uh, are also growing in popularity as well. Cocktails are great because they can kind of help you hedge your bets, right? So if you include like a drought resistant forage, like a Sudan, sorghum Sudan grass or um, one that does better in wet weather, you kind of combine those, you're kind of uh, increasing the likelihood that you'll have forage that does well, um, no matter what the weather brings in that year. And then lastly, uh, these biomass crops, uh, crops that are produced for biofuel or biomass production, they tend to be a lot lower quality um, because the only thing that biomass producers are really focused on, not the only thing, but the big thing that they're focused on is increasing that yield per acre to the extent that there's not a lot of nutrients left in the feed a lot of times. But like I mentioned earlier, some parts of some, uh, some groups of animals on the farm are going to do a lot better at that than others. Uh, so um, consider when you're feeding some of these different mixes, what is, which, which animals are going to do well with it. Um, heifers are going to do really well with, with low nutrient quality feeds. Um, we want to keep our heifers from getting too fat. Uh, so if we want to, uh, if we feed them some of those bulkier, less energy dense feeds that they can do really well on that. Far off dry cows, low producing cows, uh, those are kind of the same, like I mentioned earlier. So if we're depending on what we're looking at, uh, you know, we got these biomass crops, uh, those might do really well in our replacement heifers, um, you know, spring harvested cover crops and some of that rocket fuel um, that might do really well in some of our higher producing cows. Um, so depending on what you have, what inventory you have, um, making sure that you're appropriately allocating it to different groups around the farm. And then lastly, especially if you're trying something new, um, a, different, a different kind of forage, just kind of be aware of anti-nutritional factors. Um, so those are gonna be things like your tannins uh, and your mycotoxins and molds especially. So making sure that we're still um, maintaining uh, some of those quality control standards, um, especially when we're looking at some of those biomass crops that may be lower nutrient quality we don't also want them to have um, some of those poor quality molds as well. And I'm just gonna wrap up in the last couple of minutes here by talking about how we monitor new rations. So if you've decided uh, you're going to increase the forage content of your diet, you've decided that you're going to uh, incorporate cover crops or, or cocktails or whatever else it is, um, how do we make, what are we watching 
when we're doing this to make sure that our cows are doing well on it. Um, the first and most, probably most important thing is going to be feed intake. Feed intake should be going up. Um, unless you are limiting gut fill with low fiber digestibility. So if you are using more forage, but it's a lower quality forage, you may see feed intake go down. So you are going to see changes in feed intake, uh, most likely. Um, and it's important that we are keeping feed in front of those cows at all times, or not, not 24 hours a day, but most of the hours in the, in the day. It should be pretty close to 24 hours. Uh, cows have feed in front of them. So uh, making sure that they are not when they increase dry matter intake, that they're not coming back to slick bunks. Um, so making sure that we are monitoring that and, and increasing feed intake as appropriate, or conversely, if feed intake goes down, making sure that we're troubleshooting that. Is it a, is it a palatability issue, a mold issue? Is it a digestibility issue? Uh, working with your nutritionist to kind of troubleshoot a uh, decrease in feed intake there. Uh, cud chewing uh, is another important one. So basically rumination. Um, you can use a rumination monitor uh, with, you can use a sensor monitor for rumination, um, or, you know, just cows are resting after eating. How many of them are chewing their cuds? Uh, at least 50% of those cows should be chewing cud or ruminating. Uh, making sure that our manure consistency stays good. Um, you don't want either extreme. You don't want very stiff manure or very loose, loose manure. Uh, you also want to keep an eye on what's in your manure, um, right? So, um, if you're seeing lots of whole, uh, whole corn kernels, maybe have a kernel processing issue. Um, if you see a lot of fiber in the manure, more fiber than you're used to seeing, it could mean that your passage rates are too high, um, that you need to incorporate something to kind of slow down that passage rate a little bit, whether that's a, a lower quality forage or what have you. Um, kind of keeping an eye on that manure, not just on the consistency, mucin casts. If you're seeing a lot of mucin casts, that could mean some sort of uh, gut health issue there. Um, so making sure we're not just looking at the, the manure score, but what is physically showing up in the manure as well. Uh, and then finally, milk components. Um, so when we're switching to a high forage diet, we expect that milk fat should stay the same or it should increase, or um, depending on what time of year you're looking at, if it's summer, for example, you're gonna see a decrease in milk fat one way or the other, circadian rhythms. Uh, so um, kind of keeping an eye based on the time of year, what do we think milk fat should be doing? it should stay the same or uh, increase when switching to a higher forage diet. Uh, if it doesn't, that probably means that they're, they are sorting. Um, that if, if your milk fat drops and it's not summertime, that probably means that cows are sorting more uh, or it means that the particle size is, is too fine. Um, and then de novo fatty acids are, are a novel tool. Um, I guess not really novel anymore, but uh, de novo fatty acids are, are a more commonly used tool now that can kind of show you how, how are your rumens doing? Are your rumens happy and healthy? Um, so those are all things that you can kind of monitor when switching to a new ration. Again, just like anything else, making sure that you're doing it gradually. You don't want to switch it all at once, um, but maybe take a couple of weeks to kind of step it up a little bit. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and conclude, um, take any questions that you folks have. Um, my name, my contact information, that's my office phone numbers on the screen there. Um, so I'm looking forward to our discussion. We uh, <clears throat> have a small group here. So I'm saying if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute and ask Gail directly. Uh, if you will look into uh, the chat, we have a URL for a evaluation. I would encourage everyone to click on that and fill that out for us. It's only four questions, but it'll help us as we move through the process of creating more useful webinars. I don't, uh, is it in the chat, Brad? I don't see it. It's a, well, I can put it in again. There we go. It should pop up. I see it now. Um, I'm not seeing anybody unmute. Uh, we got a couple of questions that came in. Uh, kind of give us the top two things you'd be looking at to move a herd from five and a half pounds of solids per hundred weight up to six pounds. You know, yeah. if you're going to do one or two things, what should they be? 
Yeah, I think it's really, I think a lot of that um, most of the time does not come down to the feed itself. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I'm a nutritionist, so I really love to think that I can solve every problem by balancing the right ration. Um, but I think on most farms, it comes down to making sure that cows can utilize the ration that you're giving them. Um, so looking at that stocking density is a big one. Um, and stocking density, we, you know, we count stalls and we count cows but are, cow, are cows utilizing the stalls, right? Are they properly sized? Is that neck rail in the right position? Can cows lie down comfortably when they want to lie down? You know, are they bedded comfortably? Um, so I think that just overall enhancing cow comfort is a great place to start with that increased components there. Um, and then making sure that, that your, just the, the ration that's on paper is the ration that's actually getting into the cow's bellies, right? So making sure that we are um, feeding those really high quality forages that are, that are acting, that are actually performing the way we've modeled them, um, making sure that we are mixing feed appropriately, making sure that feed is delivered um, in a timely way and is accessible to cows or pushing up feed often enough. Um, and uh, you know, making sure that our particle size is appropriate there. So that was actually, I think like five things, but I kind of grouped it into two main. <laughs> Gail, I've got a question for you is, sure. this is a question I get a lot. Can forage be too good? Yes. Um, and that's kind of why I focused a little bit there too with, uh, about uh, you know incorporating some of those lower quality forages that can kind of pull back that passage rate a little bit. Um, so I, I worry a little bit if we're feeding, for example, BMR and low lignin alfalfa. Uh, it, that's just, if you don't have anything there to kind of slow that passage rate up, it's going to just be way too, it's going to go through way too fast. They're not actually going to get what they need out of it. Um, so yeah, I think that we can go to an extreme where we're feeding such high quality forage that the cows aren't actually getting enough out of it. Um, and that's when you're going to see a lot of that fiber and you're going to see loose manure. You're going to see a lot of fiber in the manure if that's happening. Is that the way you troubleshoot that is do some manure screening and uh, what should you be looking for? Yeah, so manure screening would be uh, a, a good place to start. Um, uh, you could also see, you know, lower milk fat than you expect. Um, so, so if you're seeing that, you know, you're not quite hitting where you 70% forage diet and you're at a three, seven, five percent fat. Um, that probably means that there's something, uh, something's overly digestible there. Um, especially if cows are eating, you can also kind of monitor your dry matter intake. So as that passage rate increases, as that kind of flows out, they're going to, they're going to eat more. Um, so if cows are eating more and not milking as much as they're, they're less efficient. They're eating much and not milking as much as we think that's, uh, can be related. Um, and you know, your nutritionist, if they're sitting in, in they'll have a model that tells them, so they'll have their software and it, the software is a bunch of equations and models based on the inputs that they gave. And so if they say, you know, this is what, this is based on everything we think being correct, this is, you should be making 90 pounds and you're at 75. Uh, what's wrong there, um, that can be something to look at too, especially if you're feeding really high digestibility forages. Those models aren't perfect either. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, we have, you know, we talked about that fiber digestibility and how there's a fast pool and a slow pool. And we're basing a lot of that a lot of times on a single sample, um, even though that curve can change quite a bit. So um, working with your nutritionist, I guess, and, and and sitting down with them and saying, look, like if this is what you're predicting, where is the, where is the disconnect between what the, what the, um, what's being predicted by the software and what the cows are actually doing? Because cows can't read, uh, so they don't know what they should be eating or what they should be milking. Um, so making sure that we're, it's, it's your nutritionist responsibility to make sure that, that that's modeling out the way that's being reflected in the feed. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Any other questions from the audience? 
You know, one, one of, thing that, as you were talking, Gail, I just popped into my brain. We always talk about leaving corn silage ferment for 60 or 90 days. And then most of that, of course, is for the kernel softness. Are you familiar with any research looking at over time, whether it's baleage, whether it's uh, sorghum Sudan grass, maybe some of these other less fermentable for or, or less digestible forages, if we leave them longer, does any does anything break down in those that would cause you to believe they're more digestible? I can't think of any research, but I thought maybe you would have ran across something and maybe you know, there isn't any. Nothing's coming to mind. Oh, you put me on the spot here. Nothing's coming to nothing's <laughs> coming to mind, but it does make intuitive sense to think that, you know, if um, because those fast pool and slow pools will vary for the for the microbes that are fermenting as well. Um, so it does make sense that certain forages you might need to be left a little bit longer. Um, but I'm not familiar. I'm not as familiar with that body of research. Nothing's coming to mind right now. Okay. You know, I, I have a question. This is Amy Lushke. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to, should dairy farmers expect the higher forage diets to be lower in cost? and what kind of factors might play into a cost analysis. And maybe you have, maybe those New York dairies you surveyed, did they comment on the cost of their diets? Uh, that wasn't my survey data. Um, and they did mention that, so they, they did talk about an improvement in income over feed costs. Um, it really depends on, it depends on a lot of factors. And I know that's not a, a real answer. Um, but a lot of it's going to come down to what is the price of grain. Um, so if, if it's really expensive to feed grain, then your homegrown forages are going to be more cost effective in general. Um, you know, if grain does lower in price enough, then, then maybe it's worth a second look there too. Um, but as we kind of keep piling on, right? So as you're, as you need to produce these really high quality forages, that's going to take a lot more input costs, right? So, um, a lot of times we tend to just kind of skirt over that when we're talking about income over feed costs. Um, and you'll hear people actually talk about income over purchased feed costs um, because a lot of times we just don't, we don't always run the numbers on what did it cost to produce that. Those numbers are there, but the nutritionist might not always look at what is the, what was the cost of that corn silage. They're just gonna assume it was a, it was a, a static number. Um, so uh, it's, I guess this is a very, this is kind of a general comment, um, but in general, uh, I'd say if we're, if we're creating some of those, if we're, if we're producing that feed ourselves um, and doing it with existing infrastructure and purchasing less feeds in as a rule of thumb, um, especially if you do see that improvement in components, you're getting up to that six pounds of components, uh, that's going to, that's going to pay for itself. It's a lot easier to do to push those higher components with the forages as well um, than it would be um, with purchase, purchase concentrates. Yeah, Gail, don't you think part of that is maybe based on your land base too? I think if you mm -hmm. have enough land, it really, it really hedges your bet. Because yeah. if you've got enough land, you've kind of got a fixed cost in your forages. Now I understand we get droughts and so we get uh, differences in yields and maybe this year isn't a good example when our input costs for growing our crops is so expensive mm -hmm. but I really think it does help stabilize a fair portion of your cost in raising your cost of production or your feed costs at least because yeah. it does take a little bit of that risk out there but I think you covered it really pretty well it it varies a lot if corn is six dollars a bushel sure changes when when corn was two dollars a bushel mm, yeah which we probably are never going to see again <laughs> well, and that's where, that's another benefit that cover crops can come in too, um, because if you're kind of reducing some of those input costs by be able, being able to use a, a cover crop to improve that soil organic matter, uh, you know, overall soil health, um, then that's kind of a, that's a win-win there, right? Because you're, you're getting that additional forage, but you're also uh, reducing your input costs overall um, for your, for your other um, crops as well, so. You know, Gail, I think that's a good point. We maybe don't talk about it enough, especially some of these perennial crops or these uh, cover crops. I think we don't talk about the benefit to the soil enough mm -hmm. 
as as long term, that could really be beneficial. And I think the other thing that'll play in this is a futuristic thing, but this whole carbon footprint kind of piece. Where do um, I think the research would surely support? And goodness yeah. sakes, this isn't an area of mine, but that some of the alfalfas in these perennial crops, or even maybe some of these annual cover crops, do a better job of sequestering carbon. And right. so I think long term, I think these forages may be really important as governments develop programs to try and sequester more carbon into the soil. And yes, that's, that you know, is. that's not a part of our discussion today, but it kind of fits in. If we can figure out how to feed higher forage diets, they surely would be beneficial in that situation too. I don't know if you have any comments on that. No, I, I, well, I don't have any additional comments really besides what you said. <laughs> uh, I think you, I think you nailed it there. Um, I, the, you know, the days are, the days are right around the corner when there's going to be carbon nitrogen credits um, for things like cover crops. And um, I think that's definitely going to be a, a, a big player uh, in the coming years as well. So um, and that's actually why we, the, the switchgrass, that's why we started playing around with it for dairy feed um, is because it's so good for soil health. Um, it really like the the producers who grow it. They tell me that they can take marginal land and convert it into you know um, arable land by having switchgrass on it for a few years there because of the root system and the benefits of that root system. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's always good to to we all have our niches, right? We all like kind of focus on our individual thing, but it is a system. Um, the dairy farming is, and and so I think it's yeah, I think you nailed it there. I think that those days are are here when. Um, we need to kind of be looking at um, what's the carbon sequestration benefits and, and the carbon credit benefits there and nitrogen as well. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, I'd like to remind everybody to uh, click on the evaluation and help us out by completing that. And then like to thank Dr. Carpenter for presenting uh, some really insightful things about, uh, you know, I just was checking today, we've got $22 milk, and you look at what the uh, fat and protein prices, how that relates, I think this has been a real important discussion. So uh, thank you, Gail. I uh, appreciate everybody uh, attending. Uh, please stay tuned for next month's webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fred.